Hi, I'd like more Warhammer, more often, please. That'll be 60 bucks for the Warhammer Plus service. Okay, 60 bucks. Here you go. Here. Wait, you've given me an empty box with the word app written on it, that single white dwarf magazine and a VHS tape with about 30 minutes of content on it. Where's the rest? Coming soon. Why are you charging $60 for this? Get a free miniature. What the? Just, you know what? Forget about it. Just give me my miniature so I can leave. Where's the miniature? <sighs> Next year. Oh, come on! Hi everyone, my name is Discourse and today we're going to talk about Warhammer Plus, the new streaming service from Games Workshop and why it might be a terrible mistake. But before we look at Warhammer Plus as it stands, we first need to understand how did we get here? So for the one person who stumbled into this video without any idea of who Games Workshop are, they are the biggest miniature wargaming company around. They utterly eclipse any other company in the hobby and are the main reason for why I'm glad that I studied Latin at school. None of it stuck though. Now, Games Workshop have always been very good at making money, and this is because they command the miniature wargaming marketplace. Yes, yes, calm down, Battletech players. And also, because they've developed a lot of devious and, I would argue, pretty unscrupulous practices when it comes to monetizing their player base, the latest of which I recently did a video on, so check that out when you get the chance. But more than that, Games Workshop have been raking it in particularly well recently. So you might have missed it, but there was a global health crisis that started in 2020. And surprisingly, Games Workshop made out of this like an absolute bandit. Who knew that a company that sells little toy soldiers that you have to spend hours and hours building and painting inside your house would suddenly gain huge traction during a period of time of enforced lockdown and massive amounts of stress. Not me, that's for sure. I really overestimated how important it was to the hobby that people could actually play the game. That's my blind spot, I guess. So suffice to say, the last two years have been very, very good for Games Workshop. They have been very successful, and it has injected a lot of cash into their business. A lot more. So to give you a bit of an idea of how absurd this growth has been, in 2019, their profit before taxation was 89.3 million. In 2020, it was 89.4 million. And then in 2021, it was 150.9 million. That's almost double the amount of profit before tax. And beyond just the money side of things, it would be remiss of me not to mention the fact that Warhammer has really entered the cultural zeitgeist in the last few years as a result of its growing popularity. Now it's being talked about in the national press, as opposed to just the back alleys of the internet. I mean, Warhammer has always been pretty popular amongst a certain type of person. Nerds. But the explosion in geek culture has really helped propel it. Much like how D&D exploded a few years ago, geek is chic. Except where Wizards of the Coast struggle to draw any amount of cash from their customers. Are you looking forward to a world where monetized apps replace pen and paper? Because I'm not. Games Workshop are basically a hungry bear that have made their way into your campsite, and rather than just be satisfied with making off with your picnic basket, they're going to eat your entire family. So yeah, they're pretty good at getting people to spend money is my point. They provide a lot of opportunities to do so, and they put a lot of pressure on the consumer to buy right now, to the extent that it actually sort of burns people out. So what have they decided to do with all this extra money and cultural capital? Well, Games Workshop have decided to swagger into the streaming service marketplace. Or SVOD, as we experts call it. What? I have Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Shudder. I am enmeshed in the world of on-demand content. But you heard me correctly, Games Workshop are now on the silver screen! Yay! And they have all sorts of new content, like... Uh... Uh... Three cartoons and a tutorial on painting faces. That's what it says here. That, that can't be right. So the existence of Warhammer Plus isn't exactly surprising and we have known it's coming for a long time. But to be frank, it's a little ambitious. So right now it is being aimed very much at the hardcore Warhammer fan or the sort of Warhammer adjacent miniature hobbyist, which is good 
because the streaming marketplace is very competitive. Games Workshop have done very well in their forays into the video game space. They've had some really great heights, and they've had some really profitable lows. But in terms of this marketplace, that is the streaming service one, Games Workshop are going up against some real big boys here. We're talking about Amazon, Netflix, and lots of other guys. So there's a lot of stiff competition. And they've positioned themselves as a very small niche service that is aimed more so at the core hobbyist rather than the mass market, for now. But they are definitely hoping that it will springboard them into a larger marketplace. That's the true strategy. They want to cultivate a subscriber base that will enable this service to become a launching pad for something potentially much larger down the line. So the service as it is right now, it costs six bucks. That is obviously cheaper than Netflix or Amazon Prime, but it has substantially less content than those types of services. And this is a different marketplace from the miniature wargaming one. The average video streaming consumer is just not going to accept the dearth of content that exists on the service. We have what? A short animation series, a couple of battle reports, and some painting tutorials? And a lore video. Yeesh. You can slurp that all up in an afternoon. Now, obviously, they're going to be adding more to this as time goes on. I believe they're adding a new episode of the animation series every Wednesday. But that is so out of step with how people consume content these days. We are a world of bingers. We binge watch, we binge drink, we binge cry. Just, just me. We need that content now. Gimme, gimme, gimme. This whole one episode a week thing is just not gonna suffice. And yeah, six dollars is cheap in the grand scheme of things. Especially when you're selling a codex for 50 bucks. But this service isn't the miniature. People are used to getting battle reports and lore videos for free. It's like when Bethesda tried to bring in paid mods to Skyrim. It didn't matter how reasonably costed those mods were. It's the sheer audacity of charging for something that people are used to getting for free. So to me, while the painting tutorials, lore videos, and battle reports are nice, they are a dime a dozen that people can get anywhere. So what does that really leave the service? Well, the animation. And the animation is really the flagship of this service as a result. And unfortunately, there's just not much of it. I haven't watched it personally. I'm not subscribing to Warhammer Plus. But I've heard mixed things, to say the least. So it's not exactly setting the world on fire here. And there's going to be one new episode a week? That worth six bucks? Eh. To be frank, if the DC Universe couldn't make their streaming platform work, what makes Games Workshop think that theirs can? And DC actually opened up their massive backlog of content. I mean, for the core Warhammer fan, you obviously have access to the premium apps, which should be free anyway, but for the sake of the runtime of this video, I'm not going to get into that here. And these apps are valuable in theory. There's a lot of problems on there to fix, but again, runtime of the video, let's go. And they've granted access to white dwarf issues as well, which is great. But it would be far more valuable if they actually granted access to the entirety of the white dwarf backlog. It's mind-boggling to me that they haven't. I would have subscribed to the service for those old magazines, but as it is now, I can't justify it. I mean, there are a lot of ways that Games Workshop could be adding value to this service that they just haven't done. They need to add actual content to this service. I mean, for example, wouldn't it have been awesome if they had a granted access to all the Black Library audiobooks? Audiobooks are one of the fastest growing formats that there is. So to get access to all of the Black Library in audio form would have been very enticing to a lot of people. Or they could have given access to the PDFs of all the codices, the rule books, the supplements. That would have gotten a lot of the hardcore hobbyists to subscribe. Frankly, if it wasn't for the fact that the annual subscription comes bundled with a miniature, I think most people would be leaving within a month. And can people really hold out for the entire year for a miniature? If you're subscribed for a month, will you be sticking around for another 11 with what's on offer? And what if you didn't paint or play Warhammer? The value proposition of the service drops pretty dramatically then. And the reason for why they haven't added this extra value is that they know that the animation is the main event. That and they'd miss out on the hundreds of dollars that new hobbyists have to spend to get into the game. And so they are throwing their main focus behind the animation. Because while they are currently aiming this at the core hobbyist, that's only to get the gears in the engine turning. They ultimately want to appeal to a mass market consumer who is only interested in accessible, casual, friendly content. And so they're relying on the animation to do a a lot of the heavy lifting here and I don't think that it can really because they are competing with hit animation like Batman the Animated Series and Animaniacs. Okay a little more contemporaneously Invincible and The Harley Quinn Show. 
and this comes from the flawed perception that Warhammer Plus will act like the digital equivalent of a Warhammer store set in your local town center and serve as a means to onboard new players. This follows the Games Workshop strategy of yesteryear, just in the wild avenues of the World Wide Web. This is the storefront of the future, surfs up big kahuna. But I want to draw your attention to a certain point, and I find this right at the beginning of the latest Games Workshop annual report. And here they state something very revealing. They want to, and I'm quoting here, do this forever. Now what this is, is never really revealed, which is pretty suspicious, but I'm not like some others. I don't think the Games Workshop want completely out of the major hobby. They make far too much money and have a complete stranglehold on it, so it'd be silly to leave, but they do want into all the other spaces because they can see how much money that Disney and Marvel are making by cashing in on geek chic, and they want a slice of that pie. And they say as much in their annual report. They want to get new product types designed for those beyond the tabletop top market into the Warhammer world. Not necessarily into miniature wargaming, which is frankly all I care about, but into the idea of Warhammer. The IP of Warhammer, if you will. Because Gibbs Workshop don't actually think that their customer is a hobbyist. I mean, yes, they know that hobbyists are obviously a huge part of the hobby, and they spend probably the most money. But GW view themselves more as the custodians of an intellectual property, because that is the one thing that all of their customers have in common. Whether you build the models, you play competitively, you're just interested in painting, or if you just read their books, the common denominator is the IP. In fact, if you ever read any of their annual reports, you can take a shot for every time the word IP is mentioned and you'll be very drunk by the third page. So really, this new Warhammer Plus is like a digital games workshop store that is aimed not necessarily at onboarding new consumers into the hobby, but onboarding them into the Warhammer IP. So why is Warhammer Plus us bad. And I have two words, opportunity, cost. And I'm going to deploy those words twice. And the first deployment is in terms of the community itself. The existence of Warhammer Plus has warped the free space of other creators on other platforms. There has undoubtedly been a chilling effect. And honestly, we'll never know of the potential creators who would have started a fan channel of some kind. But now I won't do so because Games Workshop are actively policing their IP on the platform. Professionalization won't necessarily help fans. It'll help people make a lot of money. And there's a new pipeline into the animation sphere, which is good. So for the hardcore hobbyist out there, this could mean shows that are aimed at a different demographic that maybe aren't as interested in the hobby side of things. And for someone like me, I have far more attachment to the hobby and the game rather than the setting. So I know which one I choose if it had to be one or the other. Besides, YouTube animation was doing a really good job of capturing new people anyway, because the content on that platform is free. Games Workshop are basically taking a massive gamble that complete newcomers will think that the animation is interesting interesting enough to pay $6 to see. And I think that is a critical misstep, because in my mind, you already need to be a massive Warhammer fan in order to want to pay money to see content like the story of Yarick and Gazgill Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, you forgot that Warhammer used to be a satire, didn't you? But I didn't. But maybe that is something they would have checked out for free if it was just up on YouTube. Games Workshop's position is super contradictory because they expect the hardcore audience to fluff up the numbers and then for potential new consumers to flock to it to see the awesome animated content. But by hiding it behind a paywall that is Warhammer Plus, they have shot themselves in the foot. But aside from that, a big second opportunity cost, and it's one that I don't really hear talked about much, is the opportunity cost to Games Workshop. To give you an example, the Age of Sigmar app has, or will because it hasn't come out yet, moved to premium. Now at Games Workshop were probably always going to do this, you know, because they hate their players. But now they are even more encouraged to take actions that will add to the value of Warhammer Plus at the expense of maybe what would have been free otherwise, or even things that might have been sold that weren't part of a subscription subscription model. That Vindicare Assassin, for example. Maybe in an alternative reality, that could have just been bought as a miniature. Or those lore videos that are being put up on Warhammer Plus, they might have just been put up on YouTube for free. And going even further, these shows are a huge investment for the company. Not just in money, but in time and attention. And that could have been spent in other places. It could have been spent on new models, on lowering the price of existing models, preventing a price increase, or just selling Curse City for longer than a day or my favorite, do a big Beastman release. Please, I just want to pillage villagers because those animated episodes that I was talking about earlier could be costing anywhere between $275,000 to $350,000. 
Yowzers! That's a lot of money being spent on pretty questionable content. Now, I don't think that the animations are probably costing quite as much as that, but that's the sort of cost that you would expect for an animated show. So even for a lukewarm dip of the toe in the water that is mainstream animated content, which is ultimately what Warhammer Plus represents, that's a lot of money going on to ancillary products that don't really support the miniatures. That's a whole lot of love that could have been provided to Blackstone Fortress, or anything really that could be used to build up the hall rather than just a, you know, vanity project. Because as humans, no Xenos here, Mr. Inquisitor, honest, we are really bad at visualizing opportunity cost because it's such an unknown. But it exists. And now we're in the reality where Games Workshop started Warhammer Plus. And we'll never know how different could it have been. I don't know, maybe we'll see a Warhammer movie come out in the next 10 years. Ultimately, that's what Games Workshop really want. No, not that one. Thanks for joining me today, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on Warhammer Plus and why to me it is a pretty subpar service and might not achieve what Games Workshop wants to. Because if you did, please feel free to donate to the channel over on Ko-fi. I am trying to upgrade some of the channel components, namely the terrible camera that I am using right now. So any help at all is greatly appreciated. So big ups to the first donator, John Lyons, for their very kind donation. And don't forget to throw the video a like if you enjoyed it. And if you want to see more in the future, just subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye. I couldn't think of anywhere to fit this in, but the new Eisenhorn show will probably like do okay. Not amazing is my guess, but okay. Sort of like how those random Netflix original shows perform. They sort of come out and everyone thinks that they're fine and then they kind of muddle around for a while. And then they get cancelled after their second season. I think that's Eisenhorn's fate. I'd love to be wrong about this, mind. I really like the Eisenhorn novels. I think they're great. But there's a lot of really good television out there these days. And it's going to be hard to compete with. And another thing, the Eisenhorn show is going to be on Amazon Prime. So not on Warhammer Plus, right? That's kind of weird, but okay. I suppose it hasn't even been cast yet, so it's still pretty far down the line. But still, not having the show on your one streaming service? Kind of weird.